Hello, and welcome once again to the Jazz Musician's Voice. My name is Jonah Jonathan, and thanks for tuning in. Tonight I'm presenting an interview I conducted with tenor saxophonist Alex Hoffman. For those of you who don't know Alex, he recently made a comment on Facebook, F. Wayne Shorter, which caused a firestorm of comments throughout the jazz world on the internet. He really touched upon a very controversial topic. I have to be honest and say it was one of the hardest interviews I've ever done because I strongly disagree with Alex's point of view about Wayne Shorter and uh, Wayne is one of my favorite musicians. I love Wayne Shorter's music and I think Wayne is a beautiful person. Having recently studied at uh, Rutgers University um, the music of Wayne Shorter in a class by Lewis Porter on the music of Miles Davis and Wayne Shorter, um, I do believe that I have uh, learned quite a bit about Wayne Shorter and uh, think he's just a, an excellent person. And we even got a chance to do a phone interview with Wayne. And uh, one of the questions I asked him was about uh, his record, um, Speak No Evil. And I asked him, uh, what was that record about? And he told me that uh, he had uh, remembered a certain point where um, he was instilled that one should speak no evil of anyone. And uh, I thought that comment alone was just a beautiful statement and uh, really uh, true to the person that uh, Wayne Shorter is. I think, however, that it's important to feature jazz musicians from various views and backgrounds and uh, after all this series is the jazz musician's voice and uh, I felt like it was interesting um, to me that uh, such a an excellent saxophonist such as Alex Hoffman would make the statements that he he made but it was also interesting to me that there was uh, such a uh, backlash of hateful comments towards him and I felt like uh, I really wanted to get down to the bottom of what it was that he was saying Alex can play, and although he's a young musician, I do believe he has some talent, so when he makes statements like that, he does have some sort of uh, gravity amongst musicians because um, they're familiar with who he is, and uh, they know that he can play, so I've heard uh, a variety of comments, such as um, the fact that Alex has committed career suicide and such, and um, you make the decision about that. But uh, I felt like uh, it's important to start this discussion, but to do it in such a way where you can see the person and not have it on Facebook where it's just a written thing. I like to see people's um, nonverbal communication and the way they carry themselves in having this discussion as well. That's why I've decided to create this into a uh, video discussion. So this interview is with Alex and it's about an hour long and he uh, really speaks his mind on a, a lot of things. But uh, I'm opening this up as an invitation to all of you who watch this interview and have something to say to Alex or a rebuttal of what Alex has said. And I'm asking that you guys either post a video response on this video uh, regarding your views on uh, what Alex has said. Um, there's a variety of ways you can do that. You can either use a webcam or you can use uh, an iPhone or whatever way that you want to make a video or you can send me an email using a, a website that um, I will list at the end um, you can send me an email that actually sends a file up to two gigabytes so you can record your own video and uh, send it to me and I'm going to be making a separate video with all the comments and responses that Alex has uh, made therefore um, allowing us to really have a discussion and really talk about some of the the heat that uh, Alex has brought about. So um, I'm gonna leave that to Friday. Please send me anything that you want uh, up until Friday and then after Friday I'll make another video with the uh, responses so we can uh, have this debate and this discussion. Once again, before we get to the interview, uh, disclaimer, uh, the points of that Alex makes in this video are in no way my point of view, but uh, it is important to get what he has to say. And after all, we live in the United States of America where we have a freedom of speech. And that's one of the beauties about 
um, living here and uh, I think sometimes it's important to hear what someone has to say and to have an open ear before we critique them uh, because I found that on Facebook there was a lot of people who just started making comments without uh, having read or listened to what it was that Alex was saying so um, thanks for watching and uh, please stay tuned for the uh, future follow-up videos and uh, if you haven't subscribed to my channel or checked out my channel please make sure you do so as well and uh, at the very end of this video I just like to point out that um, Alex is playing on the uh, credits music and um, just so you get a point of view of uh, how Alex sounds so thanks for watching and uh, please stay tuned Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have the opportunity to interview tenor saxophonist Alex Hoffman. Uh, I'm in interested in, especially in doing this interview with you, Alex, because there's been a lot of controversy regarding some statements uh, you made on Facebook, and this series I do is, after all, the jazz musician's voice. Uh, let's talk about what you're saying on there in a, a calm, logical manner, and <laughs> hopefully it will clarify some of what you were saying, because you do have a right to speak your mind, uh, that's part of our culture here in America. Um, so let, let's get started with your background first though. Um, Alex, for people who are not familiar with you and your background, can you tell me a little bit about where you grew up and how you got started with the music? Okay, well uh, I'm from Washington DC and uh, I started playing saxophone when I was about nine and uh, jazz when I was 12 or 13. Started taking private lessons and uh, playing with friends and then came to New York in uh, 2005, um, started to work a little bit, was going to college, finished college, not been not out of college for about four years. So uh, where did you go to school and um, uh, what did you do there? Did you do anything musically there or did you kind of learn privately? Or Yeah, I went to NYU, I went to the jazz program at NYU. Yeah, but uh, um, I met a few people there that were helpful, but most of the uh, learning in New York took place out of, outside of school. Sure, I mean, uh, New York is a, a lesson in itself. Um, who were some of your early musical influences? Uh, Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Lester Young, people like that. What, what teachers did you study with? Uh, my uh, my main teacher when I was living uh, in Maryland, suburban Maryland, after we moved from uh, Washington D.C., was uh, Paul Carr, and he was my teacher from uh, age of 13 until uh, about 18. Okay, and and um, so do you have any uh, particular memories of something that he instilled in you that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, he showed uh, us. he showed me uh, how to improvise, how to learn the scales, how to play the scales. Um, he showed me how to listen to jazz, how to listen to the solos, and uh, learn the solos by ear. So that was important. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's uh, definitely uh, ear listening and, and learning solos is uh, a great part of the music. And um, I also know you, you mentioned uh, Lester Young. You're one of your uh, models to so to speak on the tenor saxophone. Can you tell us a little about uh, Lester and, and what speaks to you about his playing? Um, well, I think the main thing is uh, there's a dignity in his playing. It's very rare. Um, kind of understated dignity and uh, a logic, a uh, understanding of all the elements of music um, and uh, just a beauty, a real beauty that comes from all of those things. Sure, so he's really one of the cats that you uh, you try to emulate on the tenor sax. Um, well, I wouldn't say emulate, but he's, a, he's an influence. He's an influence. And he's a, he's a great player and an influence on uh, 
one of the, the great schools of jazz. I mean, uh, the other school being uh, Coleman Hawkins. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, uh, yeah, those great cats are an influence, I think, on all of us. And, you know, each instrument has its particular guys that um, influence us. I mean, as a bassist, there's all kinds of cats that I enjoy, you know, you go back to the the early first bass players and then you go into cats like uh, Oscar Pettiford and uh, then Charles Mingus, uh, later Paul Chambers, Ron Carter, um, who are some other guys on the tenor sax that influence you? Well, you mentioned Coleman Hawkins, um, Don Bias is a big influence. Um, uh, Chu Berry, another big influence. Wardell Gray, um, Charles Davis, he's still around. Um, there's lots of them. There's a lot of them. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of guys. Um, and I mean, you've worked with uh, some of the who's who in jazz. Jimmy Cobb, Brian Lynch, the Jimmy Heath Big Band, the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, Terrell Stafford. Donald Harrison and many others. Um, tell us some about uh, your thoughts on some of these guys and some of your favorite memories of working in these groups. Hmm. Well, um, I would say maybe my 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 greatest memory is uh, playing with. Um, there's a pianist called Harry Whitaker, and uh, he passed away a few years ago. And playing with him. He hired me for a gig a couple times, and uh, that was really um, something. He really, uh, he was really great. And what was it about uh, Harry that uh, really spoke to you? I mean, uh, Harry's an amazing piano player, and uh, I learned a lot from him as well. Mm. Um, what in particular can you, you uh, tell us? He had an amazing touch on the piano. Um, great sound on the piano. He knew every song. Um, he played great rhythm. He always played everything in time. And, um, he was very creative, but he but he was uh, very knowledgeable about harmony. Yeah, I mean, uh, he definitely. Uh for me, I remember one experience where I didn't know a tune and uh, Harry got pretty upset. But then, you know, later he came to me and he, uh, he he told me that he thought that I was improving. And he's uh, definitely a, he was a cat that uh, helped the young players along. Um, what about Barry Harris? Uh, well, I, uh, I started going to his classes when I came to New York. And... Um, I still go every so often, and I've played with him in different situations, jam session situations, and he's definitely one of my favorite uh, musicians, living musicians, and favorite pianists of all time. Um, yeah, he just has uh, all the all the elements of music, and he's extremely intelligent in his playing, and uh, also has an amazing touch and sound on the piano. Um, yeah, he's a giant. And uh, do you have a particular thing that would stick out to you about something that he might have taught you? Well, I don't know if he taught me this in particular, but what he talks about, the, the concepts that he talks about in his class, I, I had already been exposed to by uh, Paul Carr, by my teacher in, in high school and by other teachers. Uh, but the idea that everything that you play should come from something like a scale or a chord and, and everything should be well thought out and intelligently put together. Um, nothing should be left to chance. Nothing should be by accident. Um, you should be able to explain everything that you play, no matter what it is. Um, it's okay to make mistakes, but 
if you make a mistake, it's a mistake, you know, you know everything that you're going to play before you play it. And uh, he, he's shown that to, to me and a lot of other people that just with the major scale, there's so many things you can play. Um, there's so much material. And he, he always says that if you, if you get tired of the major scale, then you're missing something. There's always another thing to glean from the major scale. Yeah, okay, so that's uh, definitely a, a particular way of thought. But then there's the, the other school of thought where um, guys like uh, Charlie Parker uh, said, you know, learn everything and then forget it. And um, then if, if, how do you determine when a cat has learned enough so that they, when they do forget it, uh, they don't play in a, a way that is, is wrong or incorrect? I mean, it's a, it's a debatable topic. Well, when Charlie Parker said that, I don't think he literally meant forget it. I think he meant that you don't want to think about, uh, you know, C7 to F major uh, um, while you're playing. You're, you're, you're thinking about melody and, and you're, you're connecting melodies using your ear, but you're not forgetting, you're not literally forgetting what, what you know about harmony and what you know about voice leading and scales, it, you're just not thinking of, maybe not thinking about the scale in, in you think, you're not thinking directly about the scale while you're playing, but it's still there. Um, I think Charlie Parker is one of those people that everything he plays can be justified. Theoretically, there is nothing that uh, can't be explained. And, um, I mean, that to me, uh, that says a lot because he's one of the greatest. I think everybody agrees that. And f for him, it was it was always important to, uh, at least to my ear, to have some kind of logic behind the notes that he was playing. So that's good enough for me. Sure, I mean, uh, Bird is definitely one of the, uh, the great masters of the music. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is uh, when, you, when you talk about art, art is subjective. So uh, perhaps for, for one cat such as yourself, you know, um, the music speaks to you in such a way that, you know, you really want the, the, the person to know what they're they're saying and you want to be able to analyze it theoretically and it's something that appeals to you. But then there's other schools of playing where, um, especially you get into the free jazz scene, um, these guys are doing something totally different. And uh, sometimes they might not be aware of what they're playing or they might just be using their ear or they might be doing something in, in a particular way that uh, is not theoretical, but uh, at the same time, um, why do they not deserve the respect, you know, artistically? Okay, I have a few answers. First of all, the idea that art is subjective is, uh, it's only as subjective as any other field. Science is subjective. Uh, we know that uh, it, any, any system is inadequate because it, it can't, it can't, uh, we can't describe ourselves, we can't describe the world except for by using the world to describe itself. So in essence, the world is indescribable. So that makes everything subjective. Now, you can say art is subjective, but it, it doesn't mean anything. Once you realize that everything is subjective, then you have to find these small truths and piece them together to try to, uh, get a glimpse of some greater truth that we'll never get, but just the attempt to try to, to get there is, is noble, I think. Art, art is subjective, but certain elements of music are not subjective. If you have a C major chord, there are C, E, and G in that triad. That's not subjective. Um, if you have a, a, a bar of music in 4-4, four, four, there are four chord notes in that bar. That's not subjective. If you're tuned to a certain frequency, A440, when someone's out of tune, that's not subjective. 
there are a lot of things that aren't subjective in music, um, or, or they're as objective as they can be, uh, as opposed to anything else. Um, and the second thing you said about free jazz, about free music, it's not valid to me because in every musical uh, subculture, I don't care if it, what kind of folk music it is from Bulgaria, from Africa, it doesn't matter. They all have rules and regulations. They all have a tradition. They all have certain guidelines. The idea that you can have a music where anything goes that's a freedom that leads to, to, uh, to imprisonment. It doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. You're trapped in your own freedom. You don't have anything to work with. You, you're, it's, it's a it's dead end. So I, I don't accept that as valid. Well, I mean, uh, when you want to talk about free jazz and having, um, the music, uh, it, it doesn't make sense without rules, and that rules are something that's uh, something that uh, makes every art form has its its rules and such. Um, socially, in this music, jazz, um, wouldn't you say that there are some some sort of unspoken rules between the uh, brothers and sisters who play this music of a sense of respect even if you don't appreciate their music respecting that they are a musician and someone who's walking a similar path if you understand what I'm saying respect is something that is to be earned if, if I don't respect someone because I use my own intellect to examine their work and everybody tells me that I'm wrong, but I still believe that I'm right. By using my own uh, uh, um, faculties to to accept that they're right, even though I even though I know that they're wrong in my mind, is a is a lie. It's a fraud on my part, and I I can't do it, and I won't do it, and uh, I won't expect I wouldn't expect anyone else to do it. And uh, I think that th this idea of, uh, of uh, succumbing to the, uh, the will of the many is, is very dangerous. And it's, uh, it's one s small step uh, from uh, totalitarianism. And uh, it, I, I, I can't abide by it. Okay. Um... I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, everyone has their right to their own opinion. And uh, it seems like uh, through, uh, through Facebook and such, uh, people want to uh, chide someone for giving their own opinion. Um, and, uh, I mean, let me give a disclaimer here. I don't... Uh, I don't necessarily agree with um, the statement that you made on Facebook, uh, uh, fuck Queen Shorter, but um, I do agree that you have a right to say what you want to say, you know, and uh, let's, um, let's kind of go into this, uh, you know, fuck Queen Shorter, because I'm sure that there are people who have taken this the wrong way, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sure that what you meant by that may be misinterpreted so i'd like to uh get that out in the open so we can discuss it and kind of um, get a more clear understanding of what you meant when you wrote that statement tell us about this and how it came about um i know it came about the night that wayne shorter was performing here in new york uh, which might have something to do with part of the, the controversy about it but tell us about it well um what I wrote, Folk Point Shorter, was a reaction to reading uh, status updates on Facebook in praise of the Wayne Shorter concert. Um, my thinking was it, it was my personal Facebook wall. The only people who are going to see it are my friends on Facebook. Um, I figured if it offended someone so much, they would just defriend me or or... 
I guess it, I, I, I thought maybe it could lead to an argument, but I had no idea that it would turn into such a, an ordeal. And um, that's the uh, context for, for what I Yeah, I mean, uh, it uh, definitely blew into something of astronomical proportions in the jazz scene, so to speak. I mean, there are thousands of comments uh, over the past days and um, it's uh, something that I, I haven't seen uh, this talked about so much since the black American music movement and uh, Wynton Marsalis' whole thing. So it's definitely something that causes a lot of chords in people. But um, perhaps part of the, the thing that um, has caused so much controversy is that uh, people don't uh, particularly understand what it was that you meant by that. Uh, when you said fuck Wayne Shorter, did you mean literally um, that you hate Wayne Shorter or did you mean that uh, you don't respect him musically? I don't respect him musically and uh, the, he represents an aesthetic and a, a, a state of mind and uh, a way of being that I don't uh, respect and... Uh, I think it's pervasive in the uh, the jazz, whatever you want to call this music, the, the community, and uh, not only that, just in general. Um, so yeah, that's why I wrote it. But I, I definitely didn't mean any physical violence or physical harm or mean to incite that or suggest that at all. No physical harm whatsoever. Okay, well, um, let's talk about, you know, what you mean by it when you say fuck Wayne Shorter. What is it about Wayne Shorter that causes you to say this statement? Well, there are a lot of musical reasons that I've, I've talked about. Um, well, say them for us. Here okay. On... Alright, well, harmonically, I don't think that uh, it's acceptable to um, bypass a certain mastery of um, basic harmony in becoming a jazz musician. I, I don't think it's acceptable to not be able to play perfect uh, voice leading, to play many courses in a row of perfect voice leading on, on a standard, on a blues, on a rhythm changes. Um, I think Wayne Shorter was uh, proficient in uh, in his in his developing stages, not masterful, and um, compositionally, I I, I can't uh, understand. It's not that I can't understand. I I, I don't think his the relationships uh, harmonically that he uses are. Uh, are intelligent or or well thought out or uh, that they uh, that they correspond to any kind of good logic um, musically um, most of the time in his compositions in the compositions that most people like to play of his um, but aside from those uh, musical well there's one more thing is that the, and this ties into my next point. It's it's, it's the the sound of the saxophone to me um, is a brass sound, is a harsh sound, is is a sound that um, speaks to a certain uh, over enthusiasm, uh, a, a need to assert oneself, a need to assert one's masculinity. Um, that. I think is uh, not um, in the greatest taste, um, and, and this relates to the aesthetic uh, part of my critique, which is Wayne Shorter to me, and many others like him, and many young people that play this music. And, and many people that came out of the 60s and, and after, and 
you know what, it doesn't matter the period. You could go back to the beginning of jazz and you find find this. Um, there's a certain premium placed on on uh, vulgarity, on on an over emphasis, on a uh, a being too present in the moment, as opposed to the people who I consider to be uh, um, masters of music. Charlie Parker, Lester Young, Coleman Hawkins, um, people like this, uh, Bud Powell, um, Art Tatum, uh, Big Spiderbeck. These people are trying to transcend themselves. You can watch a video of, of, of uh, Lester Young playing Mean to Me in 1958 and he doesn't move, he's, he's completely still. It's as if he's left his body. Um, same thing with Charlie Parker. And um, to me, this represents a kind of a, a reaching for something higher than just those very uh, uh, base emotions that would appeal to, to an audience in, in a full jazz club or concert hall that gets applause. It gets the other musicians to to yell and scream as it's so common now. Um, and and uh, I think that the, the the aesthetic that I prefer is uh, it's more difficult to obtain. It's it, it involves a kind of a, a renunciation of yourself, a, a losing of yourself, a leaving of yourself. Um, and I think the, the, the aesthetic of Shorter and the aesthetic of so many musicians besides him, it involves a showing of yourself, a, 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 an emotional exhibitionism. Now, people might find this cold, but it, maybe it is cold, but to me, the, the, you, you reap much greater rewards from the, from, from, the first aesthetic I was describing. You, you're reaching for something that is beyond the everyday. It, it, I don't like spiritual terminology. I don't like the soul. I don't like uh, it's the spirit because these are supernatural terms. And uh, I don't like religion. I think it, it leads to very bad things, confusion and uh, just uh, untruths but in reaching for something beyond yourself you are you are reaching for that uh, proverbial um, religious experience uh, without the, the religion without the soul aspect but it's it's something deeper than everyday life which is the important thing well I mean uh Let's play the devil's advocate here. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Wayne's entire work of music, but uh, Wayne Shorter is definitely one of my favorite uh, musicians, and he he's gone through many different periods musically in his playing, and um, I could just say that listening to Wayne Shorter in his different periods of playing. You can definitely see that he's experiencing a, uh, a sort of uh, higher uh, state of awareness when he's playing. Uh, I, I think any any guy um, who's a musician um, at some points may have some sort of ego tied to their playing. But if you look at Wayne Shorter, I mean, even just looking at his videos... You can see that um, Wayne is uh, thinking in another place, and and, and uh, I think um, whether or not one likes his music and uh, what he's doing, there is some something to be said about the uh, the genius of his artistic creativity. Um, I mean, uh, 
what what uh, particular examples can you give us about you know well I saw his group at uh, the Detroit Jazz Festival this year and um, every musician is in a state of emotional exhibitionism the, the body language alone shows it that the, the uh, extraneous motion the yelling um, these things that didn't happen in Charlie Parker's uh, uh, band, you know. Sometimes the audience members would yell, but Charlie Parker didn't like it. He he told people modest applause will suffice. Thank you. That's a people. Lester Young uh, also didn't didn't happen. Um, Then, then the music, uh, the, the 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 actual um, content of the music is, is so emotionally over the top, so over expressive that it loses a any uh, any deeper meaning. It it becomes like a a very animalistic thing. Um, I don't see. The, the purpose of art, if, if it's, if it leaves you in the same, in this same ordinary everyday world of, of uh, desire and emotions that, that, that we, that, that gives us so much uh, strife. That's why people need to escape from the world. That's why people drink. That's why people smoke. That's why people play music. But, I don't understand the need to recreate the chaos of the world, the the irrationality of the world, in music. It, music has always been a, a place for order, even in folk musics. It's been a place where you, you have everyone has roles, and and there there are certain rhythms that people play. You know, if you go to a South South America. It, it, Latin music is is very rule oriented. The, the clave is a very strict thing. Um, in Africa, music in Mali, there are very specific instruments and specific roles for each of the instruments. Um, I, I just think that uh, improvised music and and. Uh, if you want to call it jazz and, and even classical music in America, sometimes when it comes to the avant-garde, it loses, uh, it loses the, the, this um, sense of order. So it so it loses its purpose. The the art the art it ceases to have a purpose. Well, I mean, uh, this is definitely a. Uh discussion that uh, I think anyone is entitled to have and, and something that um, I think many cats would agree with but at the same time um, I think the the thing that's caused such controversy is um, the uh, the thought of uh, what you're saying as being disrespectful to Wayne Shorter as a person and um, I know I did talk to you that you you're not really familiar with his uh, his biography, um, written uh, um, footprints, uh, the life and music of Wayne Shorter, and uh, you're not really familiar with who he is as a person. Um, and I think when people see um, fuck Wayne Shorter, uh, perhaps they are taking that aspect that you are saying, fuck this person as a a person, and and um, I mean, I have to say that that's that can be disrespectful for someone to say that to to anyone. I f I feel like they would feel um, somewhat uh, upset by a statement like that. Um, I mean, why not say, um, "Hey, I don't enjoy at all what you're doing musically. I don't really appreciate why people are are into someone musically, but at least I respect you as a person and the life that you live." I know. If I was gonna write an article for a major newspaper or something or a magazine, yeah, I, I might have not done it the same way. But I, I was posting my personal 
Facebook wall, I didn't think uh, it, it would be uh, taken so harshly. It's a kind of expression that jazz musicians use all the time to talk about other people. Um, and, and the idea of respect for someone because they're an older person or because they're respected, this is faith. It's blind faith. And I think blind faith, any kind of faith really, is dangerous and it's something that should be abolished. It's something from the dark ages. It's, it's superstition. It's ritual. I hate ritual, uh, superstition, faith. They, they don't make any sense. You, you should evaluate the information that's in front of you. Evaluate the the, the uh, empirical evidence, or as close to empirical evidence as you can find, and make a decision for yourself. If everyone disagrees with me, that's fine. But this idea that I, I have to uh, give in to to this notion of respect because somebody is an older person or, or because they're respected by everybody else, it doesn't make any sense. Well, I, I think um, what I mean by respect, not, not that someone's an older person or that they are, um, although being an older person as a jazz musician is something that I think uh, is something to respect as it is. I mean, I'm sure um, Wayne Shorter has lived uh, a difficult life, especially as an African American musician coming up from, uh, you know, being born in the 30s and experiencing uh, racial discrimination. I mean, there's plenty of musicians now who still have experienced that discrimination. Don't you think that um, there is a certain respect for someone to have live their life in such a way and have been able to produce music, just produce music. And, um, you know, Wayne Shorter in particular, I mean, he had a very difficult life. He had a lot of tragedy in his life. And um, to say, you know, that you don't respect him um, can chide a lot of people, if you understand what I'm saying. I understand what you're saying. I think those people are wrong. I, I didn't say anything about his race. I didn't say anything about his background or what he went through. Uh, I, I didn't say that he, he didn't suffer or that he didn't suffer as much as me or, or, or that you know he doesn't deserve his success because he's black or anything like that. So I don't see what those things have to do with, with my, my statement or any of my other comments. I'm, I'm evaluating him as a musician and also his some of his religious views I talked about because I I don't like religion, um, but all those other things that you mentioned they shouldn't have any bearing on that. Well, I mean, uh, one of the guys that you uh, told me uh, who inspires you is the the um, gentleman Arthur Schopenhauer, and um, it's interesting because some of his philosophy has been compared to uh, to Buddhist views and um, so the fact that uh, you don't like uh, Wayne's religion um, can't you at least see some similarity in some of his views? Arthur Schopenhauer was a pessimist he thought the world was uh, th the worst that it could possibly be he didn't see anything good for the world in the future uh, he had a completely pessimistic view of mankind. Uh, he thought that the only escape was through music, the appreciation of art like music, and a denial of the will, self-denial, denial of your desires. Um, he thought that we were all driven by our, our will, as he called it, our desires, sexual desires especially. And um, he thought that the world was uh, only representation, illusion. Everything that we experience and see is only a representation. We're, we're not actually seeing the, the real thing. So he was inspired by Buddhism because it, it, the Buddhist text that he read, uh, one of the uh, f uh, four truths of Buddhism is that the world is suffering. The world is equal to suffering. Existence is suffering. 
So he could relate to that. Um, he was de a depressed person and he saw a lot of suffering in the world. It made sense to him as it makes sense to me. Um, so the, the kind of Buddhism that Wayne Shorter practices, um, they pray and they chant. First of all, I don't understand ritual at all and superstition. Uh, I feel like we've made it far enough in uh, in history that with with all the scientific discoveries, the, the mapping of the human genome, um, the, the, um, we're beginning to understand the human brain, the way it works. The idea that you pray to some kind of uh, superstitious uh, force is absurd to me. Um, and furthermore, not only are you praying to this force, but you're praying for peace and happiness for, for all beings on earth, which under Buddhism it, it is not possible. It's not possible to, to, uh, to uh, hope for these things because existence is equal to suffering. So it, it's only it, it, what, it, the way I understand Buddhism and the way Schopenhauer understood it was it's an individual triumph over the self, over the will. Uh, uh, in Buddhism, it's the middle path of Schopenhauer. It was appreciation through art and, uh, and, and denial of the will. But I don't understand um, the, the sect that when Shura belongs to, I don't understand how their beliefs fit into uh, the, those teachings of the Buddha. And, and it's, too, um, it's too optimistic for me. It, it just seems like a, an easy um, manipulation. Well, I mean, uh, I myself uh, have practiced Buddhism, and um, there are many different uh, um, views in Buddhism and di different uh, religious uh, sects within Buddhism. But uh, part of what uh, the philosophy of, of Buddhism is is that you make your own world, and uh, what uh, what's outside of your world is not separate from. Um, what's inside i mean you're you're inherently uh, um, dependent on everything else in the world but uh, one of the things that uh, i'd like to point out about buddhism is that i don't really feel like buddhists per se are following any uh, supernatural force per se because uh, something that the buddha taught was that um, uh, a different point of view enlightenment is uh, having a understanding of the world in such a way that releases you from the cycle of, of suffering. And um, so, I mean, uh, criticizing religion, I mean, religion is something that a lot of people talk about and, and uh, have an uh, issue with. So I guess uh, when, when you started the, the uh, F. Wayne Shorter, um, it uh, it brought up a lot of different things, and a lot of people have their own uh, views on the world. So when you say that, a lot of people have different responses and different reactions. Um, but uh, I guess the important thing about doing this interview is to kind of get your point of view when you meant that, because uh, by the time uh, I even saw the comments, I mean, there's so many different comments. It took it in a completely different direction, and. Uh, I also saw that uh, after that you uh, you said F about how many other guys you said F uh, um, Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, Miles Davis, Greg Osby, Joshua Redman, um, Steve Coleman, um, and uh, I mean all of these guys I will point out are also people of of um, color. I mean to say to say. Uh, some of that statements, you could see that some people could take it the wrong way, don't you think? Well, I could see how they would, but I don't think they should. I'm talking about people that don't play this music in the way that I think that it should be played, that don't have the foundation that I think is required to play this music, that think that a very cursory level of knowledge about uh, uh, um, harmony, rhythm is acceptable, that, uh, that, uh, that approximations are acceptable that kind of uh, glossing over of um, foundation 
is acceptable. Uh, now, that's I say that in varying degrees because some of the people you mentioned when they were younger, they played differently, and uh, and uh, then as time went on, they I guess they felt a need to be more creative or change, and 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 with that they rejected uh, things that I think are important in music, harmony. Um, But when it comes down to it, to me, you're either playing the music uh, correctly or you're not. You're either playing with good voice leading or you're not. Um, you know, to, to, to create a, a whole world of uh, harmonic vocabulary like John Coltrane did uh, is not something that every... Uh, famous jazz musician is, is going to do. To be creative, to be original, is a very rare thing. Uh, you could even argue that Charlie Parker was only original in certain ways and in other ways he wasn't. I, I think a lot of his notes came from Don Bias, came from Lester Young, came from Louis Armstrong, came from uh, uh, Coleman Hawkins, Roy Eldridge. Um, there was a whole um, scene of people in, in their late 30s, early 40s in New York that were developing a language that was all, that was informed by by the 20s and the 30s. So it's really hard to say what is original and what is not. Where does one style end and another begin? Where does one person's originality end and uh, another person's uh, uh, lack of originality begin. It's, I think it's, a, it's an argument that's too often discussed. It's more important to be uh, proficient in, in uh, playing music. You know, in, in this music we have a, a slightly different harmonic tradition than in Western classical music, and, uh, but it draws heavily from that. And I, I just think that there, there are certain, uh, 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 there's a certain precision, a certain accuracy that m must be achieved. And uh, I, I don't think that it's, it's, it's subjective. I don't think that it's up for debate. And uh, I, I think that th th there are a lot of musicians who would agree with me, both living and dead. Uh, and I, I think my view isn't uh, isn't so off base. Well, I the one thing I would say is that I uh, I agree that you have a right to uh, have this discussion and it's uh, an interesting philosophical debate. The the thing that um, I disagree with and, and the thing that uh, I think bothers people is that we as human beings um, like to be treated with. Uh, equal respect. We like to, we like to, we're human beings, you know, we like to treat each other um, or hope to treat each other in such a way that we would feel we want to be treated um, back and uh, to, to write um, F these people, I feel like some people took it the, uh, the wrong way. I, I think you probably could have phrased what you meant in a different way. Um, and uh, whether or not uh, um, you believe that, um, it's it's come out a certain way now. Uh, but I guess what I'm asking is, do you feel like you could have uh, written the statement that you made in a different way? I could have, but I wouldn't. Um, like I said, uh, I, I was being honest. I, People hide their feelings at the same time that they celebrate their feelings. I think it's hypocrisy. And I think my statement was much less uh, uh, violent than a lot of the responses that I received. And I, I'm surprised that in a community, or I don't know, community, uh, it, I'm surprised that so many people were so offended 
by that word uh, in in 2013 in in this liberal society um, it just really shocks me well I, I just think that um, what you have to see is that um, Facebook is such a public forum so to speak and uh, you are an up-and-coming um, young musician who's uh, up until this point been very well respected and, and your musicality is, is um, superb and uh, to say something like that uh, I guess there's a lot of people who who trust that you are a young voice in the uh, the music so to say something like that I guess uh, it's not so personal when you write it on your your Facebook uh, perhaps saying something like that to to a small group of friends might have been different than writing it on your Facebook, but uh, whether you like it or not, uh, it's it's taken to such a way that there's been threats against you. There's people who said, "Well, they ripped the end of Alex Hoffman's career." There've been uh, all sorts of hateful language um, coming towards you, and I think um, what you have to understand is uh, <laughs> words are powerful, and uh, to see. Uh, to use such strong language in on Facebook uh, without <laughs> context in the beginning, I know you added context later, but to use that, I mean, um, I think that's where this whole uh, firestorm comes, you know. Yes, but I'm, I meant the, the, when I said fuck, I was expressing an extreme frustration, an extreme distaste with the, uh, an aesthetic with with an, a set of aesthetic values, with an attitude, with a, 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 a um, just with the whole world of um, of thought, and it, it it was the right word. It was the intensity that I wanted for that expression. Uh, um, so I, I wouldn't change it. If somebody doesn't like the way I think, then who cares about me? I'm nobody like everyone keeps telling me. I can't play. I don't know what I'm talking about. I haven't played with anybody. I'm white. So then who, why do you care? You know, just look the other way. You know, I don't, I don't think anyone can realistically, realistically say that this, they think this is part of an epidemic of young white saxophone players who don't like Wayne Shorter. Because apparently I'm pretty much alone, um, except for a small group of people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely uh, there is uh, very few who uh, feel your way. But at the same time, um, we do in America have freedom of speech, and uh, Facebook is. Uh, becoming certainly a, a place where people can speak their their minds and uh, opinions um, and uh, I guess uh, thank you for explaining some of uh, your thought and your concept behind um, what you said on Facebook uh, I will say I don't agree with um, the way that you said it because I feel like it's disrespectful to Wayne Shorter as a person, uh, but I totally uh, understand if you don't appreciate his music. I mean, it's a specific type of music. It comes, it goes in a different way, and uh, I know there are major cats in this music who don't particularly like uh, fusion, for example, and, and Wayne Shorter was part of that. Um, so I know that there are people who don't particularly like Wayne. I just the the real. Uh, thing I take issue with um, is the the um, the way it came off because it I think it uh, hit people in the wrong way um, as far as uh, respect is concerned towards Wayne to uh, further uh, clarify um, Wayne Shorter let's talk in detail give me some detailed examples of what uh, you don't uh, like about Wayne Shorter. Specific musical examples. Okay, well, 
I was listening to um, his Freddie Hubbard record, Ready for Freddie, and I was listening to Bird Like, and his solo on Bird Like, uh, uh, we could, you know, I, we don't have it handy. Um, I don't like his solo on Bird Like, there's a, there's a lot of uh, rhythmic, uh, just uh, inaccuracy, the, the, his sound is very brash, harsh, loud. Um, a lot of the notes he played are not really justifiable. Uh, um, there's there's a lot of places where he plays um, kind of riff phrases that I, I don't like. I, I like when people play melody. Um, The the uh, intensity is is over the top for me. The the overemphasis, as I said, on every note, uh, the articulation um, is is uh, overemphasized to me. There's 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 not a dignity in it. There's not a uh, a uh, an intelligence in it. Okay. Well, um, give me another example. Okay, well, um, well, the, the Miles Davis second quintet, I uh, never liked, and uh, the Live at the Plug Nickel is a very popular uh, set of uh, records, and they, they play standards on there. Live at Green, uh, they play a Green, on Green Dolphin Street, um, and and. Uh, Again, just a uh, lack of attention to the, the st structure of the song. Uh, I don't know why you would play a song if you're going to uh, disregard the form. Um, just, and even when, when you play over the form and you want to do a substitution or something, it, it should be something that, that is, uh, can be explained. Um, or else that there's no there's no way to to evaluate it there's no way to to determine w which is uh, um, valid who is valid and who is not it it all comes down to to things to words like soul and spirit and swing and feeling that are empty that have no meaning that are you can't define and and therefore to me they're, they're worthless because, and, and they do a disservice actually because it allows whoever um, wh whoever gives themselves uh, license to to present themselves as a as a competent jazz musician because they have a feeling or they have a swing or soul at the expense of uh, uh, being able to play precise rhythm, harmony, uh, we can talk about the compositions, uh, I know yes or no, um, the, the first chord is, is what, D, D sus, right, and then the second chord is D major, the, the function of D sus is not to go to D major, it, it, it doesn't, it's it's like he was at the piano and he was playing the two chords and he thought they sounded good next to each other but he didn't really understand that that's uh, that's not how you use those two chords. Now there's a difference between using Western harmony like something like a D sus and a D major next to each other and d developing your own system like um, Schoenberg or, or or even like someone like like George Russell. Um, People develop uh, new guidelines, new rules, but uh, to me, to use this pre-existing uh, um, nomenclature with the Western harmony and, and kind of throw all of the voice leading rules out the window, um, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense. What would you say about uh, the fact that uh, this has probably had a very negative effect on um, you in the last few days. Uh, how how have you been taking this? It doesn't bother me. Um, 
people who know me already know my point of views on music and on philosophy and, and they accept me and if they do if they know me and they, they don't like my views then or, or, you know, they, they don't accept me or they disagree and, and we still get along and, and people who don't know me and have um, they have a problem with what I said uh, they're not a part of my life in real life anyway so it's, it hasn't affected my real life at all really and uh, what, what would you say to uh, the guys who call you an arrogant person or that you come off in such an arrogant manner I would say I am arrogant I'd say I am arrogant but I say I would say that honesty and arrogance is better than uh, uh, a cowardice and uh, hum humility Okay, and um, what would you say to um, some of the musical relationships and some of the the, uh, the greats in this music who have lost their respect for you? Well, I don't know if any... I don't know which greats those would be. I mean, uh, the, the greats that I know on a personal level probably aren't on Facebook and... Uh, they wouldn't. They would never know about this. Uh, I don't see this getting back to Barry Harris in any way. Um, if if someone loses respect for me, I'm I'm willing to live with that. Uh, I'll I'll sacrifice the respect of that person to uh, be honest and uh, stand up for myself. And. Um Let's talk a little bit about some of your future musical projects. Um, where are you playing in the next few uh, coming weeks, and uh, what are you working on musically right now? Well, I'm not a very uh, project-oriented uh, musician. I just uh, learn songs and uh, play uh, little gigs here and there around the city. Um, I'll be artistic director of a, a jazz festival in Italy in the uh, in the spring, and uh, bringing a lot of guys from New York there, uh, Potenza Jazz Festival. And uh, other than that, I, I play at Fat Cat, I play at Smalls, I play at the uh, it's uh, Sophia's, the Ear Inn, uh, different restaurants and. I'm playing at uh, Dizzy's with Brian Lynch in April. So. Well, uh, Alex, uh, thanks for uh, speaking your mind. And um, cats, uh, stay tuned. Thank you.